and this thing should, I think, someday win a Nobel Prize or something, is this paper that came out of Google in 2017. And the paper is called Attention is All You Need. Imagine if in 1998, China built Google. And that's all we use every single day. China comes out with this model called DeepSeek. It is, I think, a Sputnik moment. AI is one of the reasons computation was invented. You might have seen um, um, in the imitation game with Benedict Cumberbatch, he invented uh, the, the Enigma machine or as a big part of it, which helped the British with the Nazis in terms of ciphers. He was a mathematical genius. There's something called the Turing test. Have you heard of this? No. Why is AI interesting now? Now, there's been a long history of AI development. AI started in the, I'm going to say, in the 40s. Uh, 40s? Yes. AI is one of the reasons computation was invented. There's this guy, Alan Turing. You know, you might have seen um, um, in the imitation game with Benedict Cumberbatch, he invented uh, the, the Enigma machine or as a big part of it, which helped the British with the Nazis in terms of ciphers. He was a mathematical genius um, in, in the 40s and 50s. And he invented a lot of modern computation. He invented two really important ideas uh, which underpin all of computing. One is called uh, the Turing machine, which basically says that anything can be a computer if it can decide to between option A, option B, or it can follow an instruction. It is at the heart of every computer. But the second, which is even more interesting, yeah, there's something called the Turing test. Have you heard of this? No. The Turing test is, okay, I'm sitting in front of you. Uh, imagine there's a door uh, in uh, front of us. I couldn't see you. There's another door. There's one of, behind one door is a human being. Uh, behind another door is an AI, right? The Turing test is, uh, can I, as a human being, tell the difference and know who's the human and who's the AI, right? Uh, and it's kind of, it was always seen as sort of this theoretical, hypothetical test, right? But the thing about AI development, it started in the 40s and 50s, and it has always been, I'm going to call it the holy grail. Right? It has inspired people. They came into the industry. For example, in the 60s, there was this guy, uh, you know, John McCarthy, you know, he invented these amazing programming languages called Lisp, all because he wanted to build AI, right? Uh, and in every decade, there were people trying to figure out AI. And the 80s and 90s, uh, people started really interested in the idea of neural networks. Okay, This idea was like, let's figure out how the brain works. Okay, And then let's try and mimic it in a computer and maybe we get AI, right? Like for some different definition of AI, right? Maybe you think Terminator and Skynet. Maybe you think uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Sorry, sorry, Dave, you know, I can't do that. You know, you think data from Star Trek, whatever it is, that's some form of AI. Now, so basically people have been trying for years. Now the challenge the AI has been, over the last 50 years, you would see these ups and downs. Somebody would get really excited about a particular idea, right? It would show promise for a while, People would build PhDs, they would build companies, and then one day you'll run out of steam. Because what would happen is this piece of AI that worked for one idea would not work for another idea. Maybe you can detect cats, but not dogs. Maybe you can translate English, but not French, right? It doesn't, it wouldn't scale. And so, so all these ideas, what happened, they have this little kind of hill and, you know, um, uh, kind of this uh, uh, momentum and energy and then disillusionment. And people would leave the industry, companies would go out of business. And this was happening time and time and time again. Even in the 2000s, neural networks, which were super interesting and hard, every academic was interested in the 80s. In the 2000s, people were like, I don't know about neural networks. We've been stuck for 20 years. We haven't made a breakthrough. Instead of that, let's figure out alternative mechanisms. Like you know, there are support vectors, the other things that people are doing. Now, there are two really key moments that happen uh, in AI, which one of the questions I think people should ask is like, why is AI interesting now? Why not in 2010? Why not? Why was ChatGPT not built in like 2005, right? Like, why is it being built now? So I think there's a long history of technical accomplishments happen, and the two very important moments. One was uh, there was something called AlexNet which was helped build by this guy, Ilya Satsuki, one of the founders of OpenAI in 2012. But the most important thing I would say, and uh, and this thing should, I think, someday win a Nobel Prize or something, is this paper that came out of Google in 2017. And the paper is called Attention is All You Need. Okay, uh, I think this is going to be a historic paper. I think this is going to be as important as Einstein's theory of general relativity. It is iconic. And the reason why it is important is that for the first time, you know, we found a mechanism 
that just continues to scale and work, right? Like with neural networks. Because remember what I said, until then, there are all these stop and start stop attempts. You start somewhere, you throw some promise, you would stop. With transformers and attention, these bunch of Google engineers figured out this thing and they didn't know what they had at first, but it turns out like it just kept growing. And it had this magical property called uh, the scaling loss. And what that said was that if you give this more data and more GPUs, more computers, it just kept getting better across the board. Okay, this is, and it won't stop. So far it has not stopped. Um, and it's the reason why this, why is this important? Okay, every AI algorithm in the past had stopped. It worked for a while and then it did not scale. People try to be smart. They'd be like, can I detect the human face in a particular way? Well, yes, but then people have different faces. Well, you can detect the face, you can detect the bicep, right? And it just fail, kept failing. But this algorithm, right, as long as you give it more data, more to learn from, and then more computers, more data centers, more energy, it just kept getting better, okay? And so um, it was built by Google, but OpenAI, which had been built, you know, started by Sam Altman and Elon Musk and a bunch of others, you know, they kind of ran with it, okay? And a few years later came out with Chat GPT, okay, which I think is probably the real moment where people are like, oh wow, like this is really powerful and so on. So just a lot of history in terms of how we got here. Why are we even here at this moment? Okay. Now with Chat GPT, it's a closed model. When you use Chat GPT, Brock, Anthropic, Google, what does a closed model mean? You type in a question, uh, or maybe you you uh, give it an image, you give it a video, and it then generates an answer for you. But you can't really see what it is doing behind the scenes. You can't run it on your laptop or you can't like run it on your own data center. It is closed, not open. But that's perfectly fine because they have a business model. They spend hundreds of millions and billions of dollars on this. They want you to pay a subscription fee and use ChatGPT, right? But a set of companies started building open source models. And these are models where like you could take ChatGPT a smaller version of it, but run it on your laptop, right? You could run it on your phone. Um, Meta was one, they had this model called Llama, okay? Why was this interesting to how I got in here? Why this whole roundabout thing? A set of people got really convinced that open source was dangerous. They were convinced themselves that it was going to help the Chinese, that somehow it is going to make the world unsafe. And they tried to get California as a state to basically ban open source. So I was sitting here, right, you know, minding my own business. And I was like, man, this is just wrong, right? Like, because this is the way the internet should work. This has been the heart of innovation. Uh, this is how you get multiple small entrepreneurs and not just a few big guys. Not that I have anything against big guys, they're awesome, but I need multiple entrepreneurs. This is just wrong. So me as somebody who had no interest in policy, I started getting involved in these battles. Okay, so I started joining the right groups, I started putting my hand up. And uh, I was in the United Kingdom at the time. I was helping Andreessen Horowitz grow internationally. Uh, I had a meeting with the then UK government. They had a bunch of people. And they asked me, uh, hey, uh, they asked the whole group, can we make this open source model public? This was two and a half years ago. It was super safe, obviously. I said, I was the only person in the room who said yes. And when I said yes, this person next to me looked at me and said, you have just killed all of our children. I was like, whoa, like, that's, that's a bit much. But I remember thinking, wow, these people have, have infiltrated the highest reaches of government, right? Uh, and, they have, and they have sort of scared the world into thinking that this AI is going to take over the world um, and, uh, you know, and, and just kind of, you know, take over humanity for reasons, by the way, which I can sort of dispute and, you know, why I think is untrue. But that kind of got me personally motivated. So fast forward, the election happens. And I was very, you know, I was close to David Sachs, the AI czar. And I said, listen, I have all these ideas for you because I think this is one of the most existential questions. The Biden administration has taken so many wrong turns. They have hurt the American AI ecosystem. They have caused us to almost lose the race to China uh, uh, in a bunch of different ways. And I think there's an existential issue. And David tells me, well, come to the White House and help fix it. And I was like, whoa, like, I didn't know that was an option. And I, for me, this country has just given me so much. And I was like, here's a moment in time where I have the chance to give something back. And I've been incredibly fortunate where 
Like imagine you have some skill set in some area, right? And all of a sudden you get a chance to help your country with that particular skill set, right? I was like, I don't know when this chance will ever come again. I was convinced the country was going down the wrong direction on AI. I thought the stakes were incredibly high. Like if we get this wrong, which I thought the Biden folks were, we would lose this race to China with catastrophic consequences. And here I was with this opportunity to, well, step up and try and do something about it. So I flew to Mar-a-Lago and I get a call saying, hey, you know what, you're on the team. This was, I'm gonna say mid, early December, uh, a little bit after the election. Uh, fast forward a bit more, uh, the president gets sworn in and a couple of days later, and I suspect this was time, China comes out with this model called DeepSeek. Have you heard of it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So DeepSeek is super important because it is a open source model. Okay, so first of all, a lot of the people who wanted to stop open source said, well, one of the reasons we want, don't want to have open source is because we don't want to help China. It turns out that the Chinese are actually way ahead. And they actually had a genuinely a fantastic model that surprised the world, okay? At the time, it was the only reasoning model, a model which can think and reflect on itself, which was not open AI. It was ahead of so many other models that America had. It captured everyone's attention. And I don't want to take any credit away from the team that built DeepSeek. Uh, there was this team of basically hedge fund guys who had, uh, you know, who were very, very good with uh, building on top of GPUs. And it turns out that a lot of the skills that you need to build great models uh, is programming GPUs very well. So they build some innovative, cool stuff. So I always tell people like DeepSeek has some great ideas that we haven't seen before, but it is, I think, a Sputnik moment. Wow. Because it showed us that not only are we not like- Scared everybody. Yes, and because not only are we like, not like far ahead, we are super close. Uh, and we are on this wrong trajectory where we could just wind up losing. So we talked about all these companies, Google, Apple, et cetera. Imagine if in 1998, China built Google, and that's all we use every single day. China built the iPhone, that's all we use every single day. And AI could be a much, much more important technology platform than those things. Uh, and we were off to the races, right? I remember the very first day coming in, I hadn't even been sworn in yet, so they had to give me a badge and do all these things, briefing everybody. And then the president comes out that evening and he says like, we need to compete. We need to unleash American entrepreneurship. So that was my, I think the, the day before my first day, the next day I started. And we're off to the races, man. No matter where you're watching Sean Ryan show from, if you get anything out of this, please like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this everywhere you possibly can. And if you're feeling extra generous, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts.